Hi, this is Dr. Ryan Kazemi. Today I would like to show you an innovative technique for removal of failed dental implants uh, in a patient who presented with periimplantitis. Uh, while periimplantitis may be easily diagnosed in some patients, as evident by bone loss or other signs of inflammation, in others like this patient, not always an obvious diagnosis. In such cases, it's really important to go through a methodical diagnostic process before removing uh, a dental implant, uh, which may be otherwise not necessary. The removal of an integrated failed dental implant can be a daunting and a very traumatic task, uh, traditionally requiring surgical osteotomy of the implant using trough burrs. With this technique, a trough burr at least one millimeter wider than the implant itself is used to cut the bone around the implant and remove it. This often leaves a larger defect that requires bone graft uh, to restore and build its foundation for a possible future replacement. A newer technique now allows a much less invasive and less traumatic approach uh, removing failed dental implants. Uh, utilizing a unique implant removal kit, high reverse torque forces, uh, generally in the range of 200 to a maximum of 400 newton centimeters, uh, is applied to the implant, which breaks the mechanical bond at the bone implant interface and allows easy removal of the implant. Depending on the degree of the integration, sometimes a much less uh, reverse torque uh, may be needed. Obviously, this technique is uh, much less traumatic to the surrounding bone as it does not require um, an osteotomy. And it also, it limits the size of the bony defect to the actual size of the implant being removed. It is also uh, significantly faster. So let's take a look at this patient who presented with complaints of pain in her maxillary left area in the region of uh, site number 13. Uh, she had her tooth, uh, number 13, extracted about a year and a half ago due to recurrent caries. Uh, and about six months later, she reports having a dental implant placed along with an internal sinus lift and bone graft, uh, all as a single stage. She reported uh, experiencing significant pain after the procedure for some time, which never quite resolved. About a year later, at the time when she presented to me, she complained of continued pain in the region. Uh, she had taken uh, five to six rounds of antibiotics within the first six months of her surgery uh, for treatment of possible sinusitis, which uh, she did not have previously. And the antibiotic treatments uh, did not uh, resolve her symptoms. Uh, the clinical exam revealed no swelling or drainage. Uh, the implant was submerged with healthy gingival tissue and no evidence of any inflammation. Uh, there was uh, mild pain on palpation over the lateral aspect of implant number 13. Uh, teeth number 12 and 14 uh, appeared within normal limits. And the periapical x-ray showed a well-positioned implant and an adjacent tooth number 14 with previous endodontic treatment. A CBCT was obtained, which showed slight penetration of the implant into the maxillary sinus and a very thin buccal plate of bone with uh, possible dehiscence. Uh, the sinus appeared clear with no fluids or soft tissue, and there was no apparent lesion of endodontic origin associated with tooth number 14. So based on these findings, we discussed the following differential diagnosis as possible source of her pain. Number one, uh, periimplantitis associated with uh, number 13. Number two, uh, possible inflammation at the sinus level where the tip of the implant remained uh, exposed. And number three, possible endodontic complications uh, associated with uh, tooth number 14. So an endodontic consultation was obtained which uh, ruled out any abnormalities associated with number 14. So at this point, a uh, provisional diagnosis of periimplantitis uh, on number 13 was made. The site was monitored for another couple of weeks as she was just finishing another bout of antibody treatment and to see if her symptoms might resolve. But it did not, and she continued to experience the same quality of discomfort. 
So with lack of clear clinical signs, uh, several questions were raised. Was there a peri-implantitis? Was the implant integrated? Was the tip of the implant in the sinus contaminated, perhaps, and inflamed, uh, causing her pain? To answer these questions, it was determined to first expose the implant, uh, inspect the surrounding tissue, and perform a reverse torque test to assess its integration. Should the implant rotate, then a fibrous healing and associated peri-implantitis would certainly explain her symptoms. Uh, should it pass the torque test, then we had to decide whether to monitor it again for some time or simply remove the implant with assumption of some kind of inflammatory response. And should we decide to remove it, we would have to remove it in a most conservative fashion to preserve the bone, graft the site, and await its uh, proper healing before replacement with a new implant. After presenting the possible options, uh, the patient ended up uh, requesting the removal of the implant regardless of the findings uh, as she was most interested in eliminating her chronic pain. So for treatment, uh, the implant was first exposed with a crestal incision and a submucoperiosteal flap. Uh, to check the integration and its stability of the implant, uh, a placement tool was inserted and the implant was attempted to rotate uh, with a reverse torque, but it was noted to be quite stable and fully integrated. An implant with fibrous healing, as mentioned, would have easily reversed by placement of this uh, tool. Further exploration of the lateral wall revealed a small dehiscence of the implant, uh, but no granulation tissue or any evidence of infection. It was located precisely uh, where she complained of the pain uh, on palpation earlier. Uh, with this, we confirmed the diagnosis of peri-implantitis with local bony dehiscence on the lateral side. Now let's take a look at how we use uh, this high reverse torque kit to remove the implant. First, an appropriate size fixture removal screw is engaged into the well of the implant and it is rotated clockwise until it's tight. There are several different sizes of this uh, screw that are available based on the top of the implant. The screw is then torqued clockwise with a wrench to 40 to 80 newton centimeters. Next, a corresponding fixture removal device is fit over the screw and it turned counterclockwise until its serrated edges are engaged on the top of the implant platform. Using the wrench, uh, it is reverse torqued until the implant bone bond is broken and the implant is loosened. Uh, generally, a reverse torque of 200 uh, to a maximum of 400 newton centimeters is sufficient to remove uh, most implants, again, depending on their size and length. If the implant doesn't rotate with this torque, then a minimal osteotomy can be done uh, for about two or three millimeters at the crestal aspect, and then the implant can be reverse torqued again, and this generally uh, successfully uh, reverses the implant. And here is the implant still attached to the removal device, uh, which is then separated. Again, the advantage of this technique is that the bone is preserved quite well. Uh, so next we'll uh, cure uh, any loose or fibrous tissue from the site. In this case, the apex of the defect was noted to be communicating with the sinus floor, uh, but covered with a soft tissue, probably made of the sinus membrane and perhaps uh, some inflammatory granulation tissue. Because of the buccal dehiscence and epical exposure to the sinus, uh, this site was grafted. Initially, a small resorbable membrane was inserted into the site and pushed up uh, superiorly uh, to the level of the sinus floor. Next, uh, mineralized freeze-dry bone was uh, packed into the site, uh, again with caution not to extend it beyond the sinus floor level. And the lateral aspect was uh, also grafted further and covered with a resorbable GTR membrane. Uh, for closure, a very um, small amount of uh, periosteal scoring was necessary uh, to release the flap and allow a tensionless closure. 
Uh, PDGF is uh, highly recommended uh, in such uh, cases, which helps with the healing process and maturation of the soft tissue. Uh, the site is allowed to heal for about four to six months before a new implant is placed.